Good morning. Uh, welcome to Harmony Hill online in a virtual format. We're sitting here today with our founder, Gretchen Shadi, our executive director, Cheryl Cessnon. I'm Tracy Strett, development director, and we are so pleased to welcome Dyke Drummond, who is a Mayo trained family practice physician and leading coach trainer and consultant on the prevention of burnout in individual physicians and the realization of the quadruple aim in healthcare organizations. And right now, uh, more than ever, we are so pleased to have you in our presence. Um, our mission here is to inspire healthy living for all in a time maybe that it could be more needed than ever, or, or as always, and also to transform the lives of those that have been affected by cancer. So welcome, Dr. Drummond. Oh, it's great to be here. And, and when we first talked, it was about a live event that we were going to do, mm, right? We were right. going to have right. a bunch of people. Where was it going to be held? It was going to be at the Tacoma Museum, Museum of Glass in their auditorium. We were, were really looking forward to it. Several hundred doctors and nurses. And then coronavirus came along. So we put our heads together and said, what can we do instead that would offer support to cancer survivors, caregivers, healthcare professionals, the people that would have been at the event and decided to come up with a few short, quick tools and tips from my burnout coaching practice that can help people in these difficult times. Well, my specialty right now, and I've been doing this for the last 10 years, is helping physicians and other caregivers uh, recognize and prevent burnout, both for individual doctors, nurse practitioners, PAs, nurses, and for the organizations that employ them. And my path there was through my own burnout. So I burned out on my family practice back in 1999. Mm -hmm. And I started a website called The Happy MD about 10 years ago. And at this point, we've worked with about 40,000 doctors, uh, 175 organizations. Uh, it's been 10 years. We have six coaches that work with me that I trained in burnout uh, prevention coaching. And so what we've been able to do is observe patterns in what burns people out that are healthcare providers and test and perfect simple tools to help people recognize and prevent it. So what I wanted to do today was just share some of the very most simple and effective things that we've learned because they work for anybody who's in a situation of being a caregiver or a healthcare professional or anybody who's feeling anything that they consider to be stressful. And now we've got caregivers and healthcare providers in stressful times, so now I think it's more relevant than ever. My personal story is I was 10 years into my primary care family practice career, and I was with a big group, and I was the second highest producer, and I loved my job. I felt like being a doctor was half detective, figuring it out, and half educator. I think you can relate to that, teaching people how to help themselves. And one, one day it started, lasted for about a month before I did anything about it, but what happened was every time I'd go into the office, it felt like somebody was choking me. And if you've ever uh, seen a cage match, UFC cage match, there's actually a move called a rear naked choke. They jump on your back, put their elbow around your neck, and choke you out. It felt like that. I didn't know what it was. Um, I took a one-month sabbatical, shaved my head, did a bunch of yoga, prayed that it would be gone when I went back, but it wasn't. It returned immediately when I started seeing patients again. So my only coping mechanism at the time, I was 40, uh, was to sign my resignation and walk away from my medical career. That day, I walked away, which I don't recommend as a transition strategy. And then I wandered in the wilderness for a while before um, I got certified as a coach and I started my coaching practice and I started helping other burned out doctors. But it was a dark night of the soul experience that got me started in that work. I was chosen for it by a higher power. And in my situation, I, I was one of those people who was dreamed up to be a doctor by my family. So it was my mother and my mother's mother had gone to college, each of them, and wanted to be doctors. My grandmother would have been uh, 1935, so she would have been one of the very first doctors in the state of Illinois. But she came back an educator. My mom came back an educator. I was the firstborn male grandchild, so I was going to be that doctor. And when I was 40, at that point in time where I had the choking sensation, my mother and my grandmother were dead. And I'd had 10 years and 35,000 patient visits worth of primary care. So in terms of that stage in my life, that was done. And, and I had other things that were on my plate. And I was working with my own coach at the time, and I can remember um, curled in the fetal position on the carpet of my home office in my crappy little bachelor pad, covered in my own tears and snot, when uh, 
my whole reality was rearranged um, by an inner voice that, you know, told me there was more work for me to do. And up until that point in time, my life didn't make a lot of sense. I couldn't figure out, you know, where is this headed? But as soon as that decision was made, it was clear everything that I had done to that point was now going to be put to good use. Um, I know that for all of us, there's times where we're happy, but the reality is that we're, we're trying to find that balancing act between sometimes heavy grief, heavy burdens, um, complexities that we don't know what to do with, uncertainty, um, social relationships that we can't work through, personal inner voices that, not inner voices, but... <laughs> oh but no, let's, uh, let's make sure we talk that, about inner voices because that's real, that's not crazy, yeah, that's real. Yeah, the self that sabotages us, um, our disconnect from our real sense of the bigger picture, all of that are things that I think many of us carry with us every minute of every day. Mm -hmm. And then we try and figure out how to be happy and joyful and, you know, so it's that integration of all of that that I think is um, the hardest work to be done. How do we carry all of those things and find that sense of purpose, that sense of replenishment, that renewal, that joy that is possible in some moments for some of us? Sure, and then let's throw in... Um, global pandemics, let's throw in political uncertainty, cancer. let's throw in cancer, your cancer, mm -hmm. your mom's cancer, mm -hmm. your child's cancer, mm -hmm. let's just throw all of those things in and yet you find yourself crying as you're doing the dishes yeah. and all you're doing is doing the dishes. There's nothing threatening in front of you in this moment, there's nothing sad in front of you in this moment, but thoughts and feelings distract us from what's at hand. And typically the, the task at hand is fairly simple. This is a tool that I teach my coaching clients, the very first one that I teach them, that basically separates what you're doing from the thoughts and feelings that cause suffering so that you can do the things you need to do and not suffer. It's, it's like, um, it's like what a hospice worker does with a person who's in chronic pain. There's the physical sensation of pain and then there's the suffering associated with it. How do we separate those two so you can experience pain and not suffer? Does that make sense? And I think that the, the key is to give you the tools to be, able to, to be able to recognize when the thoughts and feelings that you're having are things that are supporting what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. So if I'm caring for my mother, are the thoughts and feelings that come rushing in, fear, guilt, anger, uh, disappointment, um, are the thoughts that are, that are preoccupying me right now, helping me help my mother right now, if what we're doing is changing into pens or a bed chucks or something like that. And being at choice about those, so I can say, hmm, I'm noticing this thoughts coming up. I think I'll go ahead and let that go because it's not supporting me right now. The tool that I teach is something called a squeegee breath. So you know what a squeegee is, right? Window washer uses a squeegee to clean a window. And it's usually a stroke from top to bottom. And the window can be so clean you would walk into it if you didn't know it was there. Well, imagine that your breath is a squeegee and it has the power to go from top to bottom on you and wipe away any unsupportive thoughts or feelings that you might have. And so the way the squeegee breath works is you take a big breath in and imagine you're breathing up to the top of your head and then count to two, two, three, and then imagine as you exhale, you exhale all the way to your toes, and this big cosmic squeegee is wiping you clean all the way to your toes, hold it out, two, three, and then just as you let your breath resume itself, just smile and say, ah. And um, what I do is I teach doctors to do that, and initially we have to give them a prompt, a trigger, so I teach doctors and nurses to do that. And a lot of times what they'll choose to do is they'll choose to do a squeegee breath when they open the door to go into a room or when they're washing their hands because that's something they're going to do multiple times a day. And over time, if you use a trigger like that, what you'll do is you'll be able to recognize, hmm, I'm helping my mom with her bed and I'm noticing I'm really sad. And, and, and you don't want to you know, get rid of all the thoughts and feelings that you're having because some of them work for you. And you know what? I am really sad. And I'm gonna go with that right now. And I'm gonna cry and I'm gonna hold my mom. But I'm not gonna be hijacked by that emotion. I'm going to go into it with conscious intent. Or you may say, no, I have to get mom 
to her appointment and we're a little bit late. So I'm going to release, squeegee, two, three, just let go of that sadness in the moment. <sighs> little smile, say ah, let it go, release it off to the side and do what needs to be done in the moment. So that squeegee breath is a powerful tool that relies on something that hopefully you always have at hand, which is your breath. So the first thing I tell people is don't stop breathing. Not yet, at least. There will come a time, but that's not right now. And hopefully then you develop the ability to recognize and release emotions and thoughts that don't support you. And I think part of the additional challenge for health professionals, particularly physicians and nurses, social workers, is that you're taught to disassociate. Because in the midst of a crisis, if you're all over the place with your own tears, or your own whatever, you can't be effective. But then those disassociated parts of you get, you know, buried and then you have all this leftover emotion from things that never got expressed. Yeah, ideally when you're out of that whirlwind of your practice, I draw it as a stick figure in a whirlwind. When you're out of that whirlwind in a practice, you can process things that you had to, because of urgency, you had to release in the moment. And that's why you see uh, people wanting to gather, have, having a drive to gather and talk um, and maybe not even talk about work, but just to be together when they're off work, the same people who are on a shift together. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a lot of that now. It's always, it's always helpful. What I say is anytime a caregiver or a healthcare worker is together with their colleagues, fellow caregivers or healthcare workers in a setting outside work, anything they're doing is therapeutic. I've heard you speak before about it being heroic work, and I really appreciated that term, that people who choose to dedicate themselves to work that improves the lives of others, it is heroic work. Well, and, and it's, it's, it's an act of courage in that courage is not that you don't feel fear. Courage is that you feel fear and do it anyhow, because mm -hmm. there's no such thing as somebody who doesn't feel fear. But again, fear, agony, anger, frustration, sadness, grief, the whole range of emotions. What tool might you suggest for a healthcare leader that's leading a team in a very stressful situation and realizes that some on his team are breaking down in the moment, um, some aren't, and it's sort of the whole spectrum of emotions in the room. And, and maybe it's not the leader, maybe it's another member of the team in the room recognizes this is happening and what might you suggest for a quick tool for the team to um, to allow for what's happening but to also allow for them to focus on the task at hand yeah the the, the best structure and most people about 95 percent of healthcare teams don't do this mm -hmm. but the best structure is a huddle before you start your work in the in the course of the day as long as the huddle is not strictly logistical right mm -hmm. it's like how's everybody doing Whenever I start huddles or wherever I start coaching calls, I say, what's one thing you want to celebrate or acknowledge yourself for since last time we were together? It doesn't have to be about work. Well, my, my, my daughter won the, the story of the week in English class. That's awesome, right? Or somebody made the soccer team or whatever, right? But to take a moment to celebrate because otherwise we as caregivers and healthcare workers are always laser focused on only the bad stuff. The worst of the bad stuff. There's a whole list of bad things, but we're going to focus on the worst of those. So, and then how are you all doing? Then the logistics of who are we taking care of today and what are the appointments and what are the things that need to happen? And then to be able to read, to be able to have these experiences enough that you can actually monitor your people. Because most of the time, what do we do? We walk in and we fly into the whirlwind and see the first patient and we don't even connect as people for the most part. That's, that's, a, that's a, another missed opportunity, and the reason it gets missed is people say, huddle, I haven't got time for that, right? Mm -hmm. We're too busy. So what happens is the whirlwind wins. And, and it sounds like I need to make a drawing of the whirlwind here so I can show you what I'm talking about, because it's a simple drawing, but it's a, a principle that everybody can relate to that is super powerful. So yeah, my experience of working with healthcare providers and certainly caregivers too, is that the day-to-day -day experience of what they do is a whirlwind. And I would, I would just draw it like this. Because what ends up happening is, 
especially for somebody who works in an organized healthcare setting where they're part of a de care delivery team, they walk into work and typically without a huddle, they start seeing patients and it's like walking into a whirlwind where you're in the center of a storm and things are attacking you from all sides. So here's our, here's you and me, okay? Here's me, here's you, here's anybody who sees patients or is a caregiver. This is early in the day, so the person hasn't decided whether they're gonna have a good day or a bad day. Mm -hmm. But the first thing they do, I mean, imagine you're a nurse, a doctor, a receptionist, right? A, a leader in a healthcare setting. You walk in and stuff is coming at you from all sides. And what happens is, from inside the whirlwind, again, we're healthcare workers, we're caregivers with maybe somebody who's sick that we're taking care of. From inside the whirlwind, the only thing you can see is the inside walls of the whirlwind. And the thing that you notice is the things that are going wrong, the things that are dangerous, bad, that's, that we need to restock. Why is this this way? Why doesn't the system work better than the way it is? It's a relentless bummer. And so what we need to be able to do is to flex out of this. We need to have a mechanism to step out of the whirlwind because outside the whirlwind, you can get a different perspective on the whirlwind. You can see things for what they really are. Einstein said, no problem can be solved at the same level of consciousness that created it. Well, this is an issue. This whole overwhelm thing is an issue. We have to step out to a new different level of consciousness to be able to process what's going on, to see patterns in the whirlwind from the outside that we might want to change, things we might want to do differently when we go back to work to make our life easier. But how do you establish this perspective? Well, one way is to recognize you're in the whirlwind and let go of it. So one way to extract yourself temporarily and you'll breathe yourself in and out of the whirlwind is with a squeegee breath at work. Another way to do it with your colleagues, by the way, and problem solving from outside the whirlwind with your team is the most powerful way to do this is to do a huddle before you see patients every day, right? So your whole team is here with you. Another, and again, most people don't do huddles. Another way you can get your team together outside the whirlwind to talk about how they might do things differently is a monthly staff meeting, which most people don't do because they're too busy. And now at this particular point in time, let's throw in coronavirus, uh, economy shutdown, right? Uh, social distancing, none of us shook hands. You know, all that stuff is in the mix now too. So one of the things that I try to do is to help people establish a personal method of stepping out of the whirlwind and a team method of doing it. Other things that you can do as an individual, your retreats, journaling, any, any self-contemplative activity, yoga, meditation, a writer's club. Maybe you like to cook or garden or you have a cat. Just being with a cat will do it. Dogs are a little better, but you know, cats are persnickety, so they aren't as useful for this kind of work, right? But being able to acknowledge and step out of the whirlwind at regular intervals, either on your own or with other people, is an incredibly important skill to have. So this whole notion of self-care was also something we never learned. And most people in healthcare situations and most people in caregiver situations don't take time to take good care of themselves because the patient comes first, right? And we have other responsibilities when we're inside the whirlwind. In humans, this is in all humans, where we're gonna talk about caregivers right now, energy exists in an energetic bank account. This particular bank account has a full mark, it has an empty mark, but it also has all this area below zero. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. It's just like the bank account at the bank that holds your money, but this holds your life force. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> what is this negative area? Well, let me just ask, have you, have you ever overdrawn your bank account? And if you ever did that, did they close the account? What did they do instead? Charge you. Made it worse fees and interest and accelerated your downward spiral, right? So you, you're, you're, uh, you, once you cross the zero threshold, they add in fees and interest that make it work, make it worse. Well, what happens here is that caregivers, healthcare workers, all parents, because again, the stresses that lead to burnout are present in all parents because you've put your children first. We put the patient first. 
we're all very familiar with what it's like to continue to function when your energy is below zero. When a normal per person would have called in sick, are you with me? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I, I had a rough weekend. I'm kind of tired, got a little sore throat. I'm not gonna be able to make it in today. No, 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 no. You're not cut from that cloth. So we show up even when our energy is way below zero. And we do the best we can. But the challenge is, if we show up with energy here versus showing up with energy here, the quality of our work is different. The quality of our experience is different. And so the, the first law of burnout and the first law of caregiving is, you can't give what you ain't got. You'll show up and do the work, but you'll be a shadow of what you are when your energy level is positive. Can you tell where your energy is? Remember, it didn't matter in your training, and it really doesn't matter when you're in the whirlwind. Does it matter what your energy is here? So we lose even the ability to know where we are on the scale, because again, nobody's ever shown you this, right? So can I recognize when my energy is below zero, and do I have a strategy to bring it back up again? Do we have a strategy to recover when I'm not at work? When the whirlwind has sucked me down to here, how do I take care of myself in order to recover my energy levels? Because your energy level goes up and down depending on the day, what's going on. If I dip a toe here, do I have the ability to come back up again? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to say three words that you're going to be familiar with. There's actually three of these energy points, right? So there's three of them. They hold a little bit different kind of energy, right? And uh, you recharge them in different ways. So, and this will sound really super familiar. There's a physical energy count, right? As soon as I say this, you know the other two, right? There's an emotional energy count. And there's a spiritual energy account. How would you fill your physical energy account? Again, all the things we don't do and don't learn, right? So you would eat well, you would get rest, you would exercise. And I can tell you from first-person experience as a physician, all that goes out the window when you're in training. You learn these horrible self-care habits, right? Emotional, how do you have an emotional positive balance so that you feel comfortable giving emotional energy and being emotionally available to your, to your patients, to your loved ones? And how, when I say spirit, I'm going to remove it from the realm of religion. How do you maintain connection with a sense of purpose in the work that you're doing? It has some meaning to me. And again, I think that um, what you do when you have a retreat is you hit all three. And, and what we do is have the chance to reflect with a bunch of, of colleagues about the points in time where there was purpose in the work that we do. And what I found, too, is there's a marker for a spiritual energy charge coming your way. But get ready to take it because it's coming. And that marker is two magic words that somebody says to you. And the words are? Thank you. So anytime anybody says thank you to you, it's pow right here. That's why I do what I do. Are you with me? If you slow down and think in terms of this, what you notice is a, a thank you actually fills all three accounts because spirit has the ability to fill all three. They all go, if you had a little dashboard, they'd all go up at once. So there's the whirlwind stepping out to recharge and to change the condition so that it's less stressful. It's not a battery. It's an energetic bank account. And the challenge is knowing when you're below zero and how do you get back out. And in your personal uh, re recovery strategy, what are the physical things, emotional things, spiritual things that you do? By the way, emotional, feeling like you've spent adequate time with all the people you love. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll just say this because it's the quickest way to do this. When I'm with a group of people in a live training, what I say is think of everybody that you love. And imagine, if you will, take a breath and throw them up in, above your head like a little constellation of stars circling around. So here's the people that you love, this constellation of stars. They may be family members, colleagues, friends. Which one of them 
Has it been just way too long since you connected with them? Is there somebody? Everybody nods their head. I say write their name down. So write their name down and make sure you connect with this person in the next week because it's going to go right into your emotional energy can and make everything better. I'll just come from a male perspective because I find myself in the work that I do, uh, first of all, 70% of our clients that, that come for coaching for burnout are women. Um, and then in the work that I've done for the last 15 years, many times I was the only guy in the circle, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I will say, and, and you just said it, tell us what you said just a second ago about your experience of the energy of the men when they come to your retreats. Well, I think the energy is that they are feeling very wounded, but they don't know how to talk about that. They feel like they shouldn't be, they should be able to figure this out. Fix it. Fix it, fix it. Which is, you know, then they realize they don't know how to fix it, they can't, and then they're depleted. Yep. And, and what it is, is it's the same struggle with an emotion that, and a feeling and a thought that doesn't support them in the moment, mm -hmm. right? Because can they fix it if, if a loved one has cancer? A terminal cancer diagnosis. Can they fix it? No, but everything about their biology and their training and upbringing and culture says if there's a problem, I protect my people and I fix it. And I can't. Mm -hmm. So there's just all sorts of guilt and sadness and, and stuff that needs to be processed at that point. When you look at the kinds of people that come to you for the work and you say that most of them are female, does that mean that the males are just not... How are they? I mean, they're getting burned out. What are they doing? Yeah, they that? just don't ask for help. Okay. Because again, um, uh, especially if I've been through the hardening, the work hardening, and the, the survival experience of being trained as a physician, or a nurse, or a pastor, or a nurse practitioner, a PA, and a nurse anesthetist, nurse midwife, anybody who has gone through a significant... Um, in the, uh, the energetic bank account, I say residency is like being held underwater mm -hmm. to see how long you can take it. Mm -hmm. If you've been through that process, to admit that you're having trouble getting through your days is, is one thing that you would never want to do um, because at least for doctors, there's two prime directives. The first one is the patient comes first, which gets us in trouble if we don't know how to turn it off. And the second one is never show weakness. Mm -hmm. So I can't say, hey, I'm, I'm having trouble here. Or uh, all you have to do is go up to a doctor and say, hey, you look tired, are you okay? And they're gonna say, no, I'm fine, go away. And I can tell that they're a fixer and a doer and, a, and an, I, an iron person, right? Superman, superwoman, mm -hmm. and they're asking for help. I always reinforce that as strongly as possible as being a super positive thing for them, their family, their patients, their soul, mm -hmm. the course of their life. Um, and when we used to do retreats, I used to do a bunch of treats. We used to do sweat lodges and things like that. The people who could never accept help, you know, the people who could never ask for help always broke their leg. Mm -hmm. They always broke an ankle. And so then they had to be either carried or crutched around for the whole rest of the retreat. They were forced to ask for help by the energy of the group, right? Wow. Had, we had, had it happen three times, and it was the perfect person in the group to break their hand and kill. It feels like such a burden to have to carry that, though. To have to carry that right. must be perfect at all right. times. Right. Well, I was the firstborn male child, right? Dreamed up to be a doctor, so I know that stuff really, really well. Have you ever had a retreat where it was all men and they could actually cut loose and talk about I have this not. amongst themselves? I have not. I think it'd be fascinating to have a group be able to be put together like that. Indeed it would. Yeah. And I think of other um, helping professionals as well, the fire department, the police. Right, first responders. The kind of things that they deal with and often don't have a way to... to let it go. Right, and if you look at the spectrum of stresses that burn people out, um, it's anyone whose, whose job um, puts the people they're meant to serve first. Um, and by the way, it's and all parents, right? Because you're, yes. you're gonna put your kids first, right? But, but if we talk about the risk of burnout accelerating upwards, doctors and nurses are up here, pretty high on the scale because of the programming, the patient comes first. But then here there's teachers, there's pastors, there's uh, 
therapists, there's ethical uh, financial advisors, right? There's certain leaders. Not everybody is ethical financial advisors, so some of those people don't care about other people, so they won't get burned down. But then the two extremes of this curve are uh, first responders, I would say three extremes. First responders, law enforcement, war fighting military. Because we are, patient comes first. First responders are, we run to the noise. Mil, uh, law enforcement is, we protect and serve and are expected to lay down your life. And war fighting military are in the line of fire. So if you look for burnout, suicide, drug addiction, and things like that, as a result of burnout, you're gonna see it. I mean, we've seen what's happening now in, uh, in the military veteran world where they have multiple suicides every day. Secondary trauma. Right. Hearing stories and seeing things happen to people over and over and over again for years and years. And that secondary trauma just starts building and accumulating within right. you and, um, and there's no place to go with it. Right. So yet another if you don't build a, If you don't build a structure that is regularly available yes. with trained professionals to process those okay. things, it builds up. But again, we're too busy. Uh, I, got, I got other things to do. I'm not going to come back in for this hour-long meeting that's every other week that we get together. And you'll also see there's also a spectrum amongst any group of people. There are people who will do those kind of get-together events, and there are people who will never do them. Mm -hmm. And you know they're never going to show up. And you have to be okay with that, too. I will say 90% of the time, if you say, let's just let go of anything that doesn't need to be here, if you use your hand, if you take a breath, 90% of the time they're gonna go with you. And if they go with you, the next thing they're gonna say most often is, hey, can we do that again? Mm -hmm. And if you do this with them a couple of times and then you forget on like the third or fourth time, let's say you see them twice a week. My wife's a home speech therapist, so she might see somebody twice a week. If you do that for three or four times in a row and then you show up and you forget, they're gonna say, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Where's that breathy thing? Mm -hmm. And it will help them pop out of the whirlwind. You will give them a burst of healing energy just because they're outside of their whirlwind, regardless of the work that you do with them. And they'll get better at recognizing their own ability to, to, to manifest the magic bubble and step out of the whirlwind. Mm -hmm. Every uh, meditative uh, presencing tradition in the world depends on breath. Now, um, the reason I don't tell people what I'm doing is giving them a mindfulness tool is because mindfulness in most people's Western minds is associated with um, meditation. And if I say meditation to a group of people, and I've done this to tens of thousands of doctors, hey, when I say the word meditation, how many of you say, oh man, I'm no good at that. And I, I have them raise their hands. And it's always two thirds of the room, the hands go up. And then I say, because this is true, the reason that you feel that way is because you've been traumatized by a bad meditation teacher. Because a bad meditation teacher says something like this, close your eyes and quiet your mind. And the thing is, you can't quiet your mind. And every good meditation teacher knows that. The Dalai Lama knows that, Thich Nhat Hanh knows that, Rachel and Emily Remen knows that. Everybody knows that, you can't quiet your mind. If you look at how the Sanskrit from the Buddhist scriptures reads, one of the descriptions of how our mind works is that your mind is like a drunken monkey stung by a thousand scorpions. So one of the things that can happen if you are breathing and finding that you are are having recurrent thoughts and feelings come up that you have to breathe and release over and over again, you may feel to yourself like, man, I'm not very good at this. Why can't I quiet my mind? Mm -hmm. That's because it's impossible to quiet your mind. And that's the misperception that keeps people from the power of being able to breathe and release. Breathing and releasing Oh, there's that sadness again, breathing and release. If it's not serving you, breathing and releasing. Noticing patterns in what you're breathing and releasing and maybe journaling on those and thinking about that at a time when you're outside the whirlwind. These are the features of a life that's examined as opposed to an unexamined life is not worth living. To me, mindfulness means giving what's in front of me my undivided attention. So, um, that's not John Kabat-Zinn's definition, right? Although it's pretty close. So what I notice is, and this is my personal experience, uh, so right now I'm talking to you and I'm cognizant of the cameras around here, right? But I'm also having thoughts and feelings come in 
from each side. So I know that I have appointments later today, so I've got a thought about later today. Maybe I'm a little worried about that, right? And what happens is your attention is like a hose. If you direct it at one thing, it gets all of the hose. But if I direct it at three things, it only gets part of the flow. So this whole thought about multitasking, multitasking makes you stupid, right? Example, when have you ever been driving down the road and the person in front of you is so erratic that you swear they're drunk and you finally get a nice long section of road and you decide, I don't want to be behind this person and you drive by them and they're not drunk, are they? What are they doing? Talking on their phone or texting. They're multitasking. And what it means is it makes, it takes, if you're all your attention is on driving, you're a pretty good driver. But if I add in texting, it's only half as good a driver. Multitasking just made you stupid. As a caregiver, the people that you're caring for know when you don't give them your full attention. The, deaf and, the people who've been in front of the Dalai Lama or certain other famous people, what do they say about the experience of being with the Dalai Lama? It's like I was the only thing in the room for him, right? And there's other people that they say that about, that they're able to actually hit you with the whole full energy of their attention and it's such an amazing experience it makes i mean i've got goosebumps right now right so <laughs> mindfulness for me is the skills to recognize when your attention is divided and if it's appropriate to reassemble that attention into a single focus and one of the ways you can do that is with this squeegee breath thing what's the task at hand and does that play a role in making you better at the task in hand? So, so um, um, what happens is the fundamental experience for many people in the whirlwind is being hijacked. Like you'll have a fearful emotion and it will hijack you and actually harm your ability to work with the person in the room. You're worried about your fear rather than your patient's issues, right? So this whole technique of breathing and releasing things by recognizing they don't serve you is a, a mechanism to keep you from being hijacked. And so you can actually watch politicians on the news speaking in front of people. You can watch when they're conscious of what they're saying and they're not distracted and you can watch them go off into some kind of screed or rant about something where an emotion comes in, hijacks them and they start to go off script and say things that they later regret or that aren't particularly useful, you can watch them go in and out of their attention span. And we do the same thing, right? Like I might say something in anger to my wife because she said something that I thought questioned my ability, right? And we all do the stance. And um, ultimately you have to recognize that this is true for everybody. There's nobody that's perfect. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh is the Buddhist monk from Vietnam that taught John Kabat-Zinn, who developed the mindfulness, mindfulness-based stress relief for doctors. And there's a story about Thich Nhat Hanh. He leads meditation retreats where they do two weeks of silence, right? And But they have a question and answer session. I don't know how it works, but it's a question and answer session at certain times in the event. And he's famous for, um, for saying, uh, somebody uh, said, uh, stood up and said, Oh, Master Han, I'm sure when you close your eyes to meditate, that you just enter into the black void. And he, all of a sudden he's doing this, and people realize he's laughing. Hmm. And he says, No, 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 no. My mind is just like yours when I meditate. Drunken monkey stung by a thousand scorpions. I'm just better at recognizing it and letting it go. So right now what's happened is if we had a volume knob on feelings and emotions. Somebody's taken everybody's volume knob and turned it up. And ideally you have some of these skills and it's gonna be something you notice that you do a lot of. Does it help me right now? What am I doing? I'm running a meeting of my people. What's the, ta what's the subject? Okay, cool. Does it, do people need to process this, right? Like so, sometimes, for instance, you'll find that people will want to complain and pound the table and rend their clothing and they're really upset. It's like, okay, you got 60 seconds, go. Let's get it out of our system because 
having it in the room isn't helping us accomplish our objectives, that's another way to do it in a group that sometimes is kind of funny, because most groups, if you turn them on like that, can't be upset for more than about 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. Are you all done? Okay, can we move on? Everybody take a big deep breath. <sighs> like that. I think in this pandemic, it's an additional challenge of isolation. Mm -hmm. People have to keep at least six feet apart and can't really gather, and yet at the same time, we need each other for support. Mm -hmm and to be able to be our authentic selves and say, I'm scared or I'm whatever. Right. So that we can all hold the possibility of lifting each other up. It's hard to do in isolation. Well, and I've heard um, a new policy I just heard over the last couple of days is when a loved one is hospitalized, no visitors. Mm, right. If you're not COVID positive or treating people on the ward, you're not on the ward. We don't allow family in there. Yeah, Amy, over the, I mean, her husband's. Yeah. Right, I can't go visit him, right? right. So again, you would need to, there's still the kids to be taken care of, the dishes to be washed. Maybe you can do a video connection in some way. And um, when, you're, when you actually have the ability to connect with somebody, if video is your only option, you'd really, I think, hope that you could be focused mm -hmm. and present when that happens. Healthcare professionals have things, uh, patient satisfaction ratings, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, and healthcare professionals don't like them very much because um, it's, we'll say it's not about the patients being happy, it's about us being good clinicians. But here's the interesting thing. What is the universal complaint when you get a bad patient satisfaction rating? What do they say? They say the doctor didn't listen, the doctor wasn't, was present. looking at the computer, wasn't present. So your ability to be present and give the person in front of you your undivided attention is your patient satisfaction rating. Mm -hmm. And if you are a care worker and you come into work and they don't have adequate protection for you uh, and you're aware of this, everybody's aware of this and what you're being expected to do is to risk your life, that turns your job into a suicide mission potentially for you mm -hmm. or one of your family members. It's one of the things where um, I personally believe that's a 100% a, a, a life-threatening failure of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the failures are cascading failures at this point. There, there's local failures, there's regional, there's national failures. And then the question comes down to what do you do? And I again saw an article today about healthcare workers who were turning around and walking out because they felt that they were being asked to put their life at risk for a system that wasn't working. Now that's really stepping outside your patient comes first programming. But again, it's not meant to be something that you die for. It's very complex and um, heartbreaking. Yep, mass casualty, war, all of that. Your triage activities are determining who's going to live and who's going to die. Yeah. It's also interesting in terms of the creative way that people are coming up with these high school kids that are making these face bearers, Nordstrom's having their fashion department making right. masks. I mean, it's really an opportunity for people to think outside the box. Right. And it's also a condemnation of just-in-time uh, supply chains in healthcare. Right. Oh, we only stock a week's worth. Mm -hmm. hmm. <laughs> when might we need more than that, right? right. Yeah. And again, you can... Again, you can go on Facebook and rant all you want and give it up, right? But the question is, when I've got it, something to do with the patient in front of me, how do I clear to give them my undivided attention, the whole pipe? Mm -hmm. To the extent that it doesn't, you can release them. And here's what I'll say. Um, the thing that's unusual is the stability of the last 40 years. Right. That's what's unusual, right. is that we have begun to believe that that normal was normal, and somehow this is not normal. But our experience of a day is a moment-to-moment -moment assignment or a moment-to-moment -moment choice about what you're going to focus on. Uh, ahead of the curve in some ways, because all of what we do around working with people with cancer and all of the tools that people who have cancer are gaining while they're here give them the tools to live in an uncertain world right. in a way where they can stay connected with their purpose and uh, stay inspired. 
So it, it, they, I kind of feel like we've been doing that training and that the people who have come to Harmony Hill with their, for the cancer retreats have a skill set that is actually serving them really well mm -hmm. during this time. Now other people are stepping into that same world that they've already been in, which is what do I do with this uncertainty? And now they have a chance to develop those skills and go to the next level with it. Well, and I, I think there are certain times in our lives, and this pandemic may be one of them, a cancer diagnosis is another one, where the thing that gets turned up is your ability to see your priorities more clearly. The courage of people to show up and how they need each other. I mean, we just did one a few, maybe three weeks ago, I don't know, and with a lot of people with metastatic late stage cancers, they were so thrilled to be here. And even before we started the first group, they were bonding at lunch. They were, we, we tell this story about, you know, of a research, of a small research of a, a steep hill that people were given a heavy backpack and were asked to climb the hill. And what they found was that people that walked with a companion whether it was someone physically or like in our case that we become companions, the hill didn't seem as steep and the backpack wasn't as heavy. Right. And so that's all part of the, the bonding that happens and they start talking to each other who are on a similar path. And it's phenomenal just to witness how they can, they can get through this more smoothly by having companions and being able to be their authentic, authentic self and say they're really scared, they don't know what to do, um, that they're not alone in it. There's that, something about community at this time that's so critical. And they're not talking about what they do for a living, and they're not talking about politics, and right. they're reduced to essence, yeah, exactly. right?